All right, here we are in Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage. This is uh, lesson number 11 in the series and the title of uh, today's class is Blended Families Part Two. Blended Families Part Two. You know, in our, in our first lesson on blended families, we uh, reviewed the major cause for divorce in second marriages. In other words, never mind there's a divorce you know, in, in the first marriage, many times there's also a divorce in the second marriage and I showed you some of the statistics of why that takes place and mentioned that uh, child rearing and family related problems were near the top of the list as far as reasons for a divorce in a second or what we call a subsequent marriage. So this is why a lot of the counseling for blended families, we know what blended families are, you know, take two, you know, my kids, your kids, you know, and we create a new family. This is why much of the counseling for blended families centers on integrating the whole family and not just the two individuals who are getting, uh, who are getting married. Now I shared some of the ways to prepare for a subsequent marriage. We talked about that last time, just to show these again as a way of review, how to prepare for a subsequent marriage. So we mentioned you don't know your future mate and their children. Don't just spend time you know, trying to get to know your future mate. If there are children involved, that's an entire package. Also paying attention to the children's needs, their particular needs, building a new relationship, not just taking a, you know, what was in your old relationship on this side and what was in your old relationship on this side and trying to patch that together. The whole idea of a subsequent marriage, a blended family is to create a new relationship. And also uh, a little tip, include everybody in the wedding because the wedding is the starting point if you wish and it's a very uh, good idea to get everybody involved, their children and so on and so forth. We also talked about ways of achieving the unity necessary for any family to succeed, but this unity is a, an especially difficult thing for blended families to arrive at. We talked about some of the things to try to avoid um, in a subsequent marriage in a blended family. Avoid the co-conductor system, you know, my rules and your rules and you know, the two conductors. Uh, not a good idea. We have to have you know, similar rules, same rules for everybody. Uh, give up the old roles uh, in the family. This is a new family and so we have to, you know, we have to uh, take on the new roles in that family and also establish some basic ground rules that everybody has to follow. Uh, whatever they are, ground rules for who gets the remote, how much TV time, curfew, so on and so forth we have to establish new ground rules that everybody needs to follow. The children from both families need to be uh, aware of. And finally, we saw that the true unity in any family can only be arrived through Jesus Christ. The Lord can heal and bring together a blended family into one single, you know, one single unit under the Lordship of Christ. And that's what uh, Paul is talking about in Galatians 3.26 and 28. Listen, you know, if the Lord can bring together into one unit, one family, Jews and Gentiles, you couldn't get two more disparate groups of people, He certainly can be the one to bring together two families into, into one family. So building your new family around the Lordship of Christ is uh, certainly a very important element uh, to do, to, to shoot for. All right, so now we're going to continue in this series with more discussion on the child's reaction to blended family situations and how to deal with this, especially as a step parent uh, and uh, trying to bond with children who are not your own, that you may have to parent, but they're not your children, okay? They're the children of your spouse and so on and so forth. So since much of the success of blended family rides on how well the children are integrated and accept the new situation, it's important to discuss how they react to the blending of a family. So you have to understand that children grieve. When a family breaks up, children go into mourning. 
And it doesn't matter what reason that family, if a spouse dies, uh, of course it's more obvious that, uh, at that point, but even when there is a divorce, children mourn and like any period of mourning, they go through a grieving cycle for not only the parent that they have lost, but also for all the family times that they have lost. You know, the lifestyle that they once knew. And here's the thing, whether that lifestyle was good or bad, even if that child was in, you know, even if the former marriage was yelling and screaming and, you know, and so on and so forth, children many times would much prefer, much prefer having the thing they know, even if it's difficult, than going to something they don't know, which is frightening, okay? Uh, for children, the grieving process is exactly the same as for adults, except it is worked out in a new environment, which is the blended, which is the blended family. So some of the, you know, we know we're familiar with the, the, the grieving cycle, but let's look at it from a children's perspective. Denial. Children have a hard time accepting the finality of divorce. And this sometimes motivates their uh, efforts to sabotage any new marriage because they don't accept it. Whether they're acting out in bad behavior or they're you know, openly rejecting the, you know, the new parent, if you wish, or the opposite, you know, this passive aggressive uh, activity, they're indifferent. You know, she says to mom, do, it, you do what you want, I don't care. You want to marry him, I don't care. It's none of my business. You know? Denial you know, is tough because kids don't tend to talk things out. So the best way is to, of course, lovingly point out the truth of the new situation and give them time to react. And especially boys. Boys uh, are much more you know, affected uh, and have much more difficulty with the grieving cycle because boys don't talk. Girls will talk. If you can get them going, they'll talk about their feelings and so you know, they'll talk. But boys don't talk. Boys you know, just want to get on with stuff. They want to get back to their ball game and school and activities. And it's like, wow, that was quick. Man, he got over that in a hurry. You know, don't be fooled by that. That's just his way of coping. Boys are notorious for putting off grieving, not just for months, but for years. And then all of a sudden, you know, something that happened when they were 12 or 13, 10 years down the road, all of a sudden, bang, it, starts, it hits them. Because the thing about grief you have to understand is you can't bypass grief. You can't skip over it. You have to go through it. So you can put it off as long as you want. One day, one year, a decade, two decades, it doesn't matter. Eventually you have to kind of pierce that, that sadness and it has to, it has to appear. The second, um, the second you know, level, if you wish, is anger in the cycle, second point in the cycle, anger, denial, anger. When children realize that dad is not coming back or that this is the new mom, this is the new home, many times there's an angry reaction. You know, kids take it out on teachers, on siblings, on themselves, even on their parents. They're always mad about something. Now, if possible, the biological and the step-parent need to help the child get in touch with his feelings and identify what they're angry about. In other words, try to help the child match the feeling with the reason. Why, you know, why are you angry? And sometimes it's something that can be quite banal. You know. I mean, they're angry because I lost my room. I have to now share a room. Or you know, in the old house, my room was you know, next to the whatever, and I like that room. And I don't like my new room. It has nothing to do with you or the, the new mom or whatever. It has to do with the room. You, you never know what it is. So the idea is you're, you're trying to help them connect the feeling with the reasons. Bargaining is the next step in the cycle of grieving. And this is where individuals will try to manipulate people or events to change the past. A lot of times adults you know, make deals with God. Oh God, you know, if you do this for me, if, if, if I pull through this disease or whatever, I promise I'll always go to church or I promise I'll give a lot of money to the whatever. You know what I'm saying? We bargain to try to change the outcome of something. 
Now in divorce, the children dream about the parents getting back together again, may even suggest it. So the advice is don't give children false hope just to save them that moment of pain. Okay? Let them go through this stage at their own pace and help them understand that this family is the family that will now be permanently established. We're not going back. This is the new truth. Difficult, we want, you know, the, the last thing we want for our children is for them to suffer. And I understand that as a parent as well. You know, we would rather take the suffering you know, ourselves. You know, let me suffer this for them, but it doesn't work that way. They have to come to that realization. Uh, sometimes you know, children all of a sudden are very good and very obedient. You know, your, your wild child all of a sudden becomes really, you know, oh mommy I love you and everything is great. And you know, try to understand that that's a form of bargaining sometimes. If I'm really, really good and if I really, really obey and so on and so forth, maybe everything will get back to what it was. And of course the root of that is the child may, may, many times may think they had something to do with it. Depression is the next stage or one of the stages. Don't get me wrong, these things don't normally follow in order, right? I mean, they're just different stages and, and peop, adults as well as children, they bounce from one to another. So don't put the you know, denial, then anger, then bargaining. Don't put these on a, a continuum. Put it like a circle instead. You know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, except, you know, it's a circle. And they go from here to here, down to up and down, and you know, they go around and around until they finally land somewhere. Uh, depression, the roller coaster nature of blended families is what leads to depression. In death, the loss is final. We, 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 get our, our, uh, we, you know, we get over the sadness and the reminders and we go on. It's difficult. You know, dad is gone or mom is passed. You know, it's, it's hard. I'll never see them again and so on and so forth. But in blended families, the loss is always there. And your children are always reminded of it every other weekend if there's, you know, if there's visitation. Eventually the loss is mourned, um, is, is, is mourned out when new relations take hold in the blended family and children resolve feelings about biological parents and they create new and meaningful relationships with them. In other words, they have to now learn how to create a new relationship with the parent who is gone. And they have to learn how to create a new relationship with the new parent that has arrived. And there's no way around that. The relationship with the parent that is gone is never going to be the, what it was you know, in the past. And they just have to get to that point. If they are unavailable, this may be very difficult. When I say if the parent that's no longer there, you know, the other, you know, the non-custodial parent, if that parent is not available, wants nothing to do with the children, there's no way around that. That is a very difficult situation. But children you know, with your love and with your encouragement can eventually uh, deal with that uh, issue. And then of course the, uh, the idea of acceptance. Acceptance is the realization that the blended family is not a nuclear family. It is not my original family, but it's a good family and there's a place in this family for me. And I am loved in this family, and I can't say it enough. You know, parents, both parents, uh, you know, bio parent and step parent, you can't tell your children enough that you love them. You can't say it enough. You can't demonstrate it enough. Because in the end, their loss and their fear is that they've lost the love of the parent. And so they need a lot of reassurance. Peter the Apostle says, love covers a multitude of sins in 1 Peter 4, 8. In blended families where there is faith and Christian love, the sins of the past are covered and a chance for a peaceful and joyful family experience are there for each member because not only the love of the parents are there, but the love of Christ is there as well. All right, let's talk about development levels, shall we? Just as there are specific reactions of children to divorce, 
and the reforming of family, there's also specific needs of children at each age group when they find themselves in this you know, blended family situation. So from zero to two years of age, they need a lot of touching and nurturing as a way of reassurance that everything, despite the changes, uh, everything is okay. Imagine you know, these little kids, when, you know, from zero to two years, you know, a family breaks up, they can't articulate their feelings, they can't say, mommy, what's going on? Where's daddy? You know, they can't say that. All they know is that things have changed. Things have changed. And you know, those of you, and I look around and I think pretty much everybody here, those of you who have children who remember the little baby stage, babies don't like change. I mean, just one day you take them out of their routine and you go visit grandma or something, oh boy, you pay for it when you get home because if they miss the time for their nursing or they miss their nap, you know, how, how, how great are kids when they don't take their nap? So imagine the impact on them when you take daddy out of the equation or you take mommy out of the equation. So they need a tactile reassurance. You can't, you know, this business says, don't hold that little you know, eight week old baby, don't hold that little one year old baby, you'll spoil them. You can't spoil them. Nobody gets spoiled from being loved too much. From three to five years of age, children at this stage are old enough to know that something is wrong, but they're too young to process all of the information and they also have a short memory. You know, little toddlers at that age, they're over here looking, you know, you ever try to teach little kids this age how to play soccer? You know, one minute they're looking at the ball and the coach says, go ahead, run with the ball, kick the ball. And the next minute they're going, oh, flower, dandelion. You know, they're sitting, you know, they, they don't pay attention. So it helps to explain things over and over again and be patient, and be patient with you know, regressive behavior. In other words, the child who's four, the way that they act out when they go through trauma like this is they regress. They begin to act like two-year-olds. A child that was you know, potty trained all of a sudden isn't potty trained anymore and parents are going, what? What's going on? Well, that's how they, that's how they react. That's how they act out. Okay? So allowing them to bring comforting objects to the new home uh, helps as, as much uh, of a reminder of the past that you can provide for them in the new situation can be helpful. Children from six to 12 years of age. This is the age group where there is a feeling of responsibility. Kids this age, you know, it's my fault or uh, you know, they somehow feel it's their responsibility to bring mommy and daddy back together again or they have a sense of adult grief. Now one thing that's very important when there are children this age, for parents, whoever the parent is, you know, custodial parent, non-custodial parent, do not use children this age as a sounding board for your own fears, your own anger, your own blame of the situation. You see parents sometimes you know, talking to their 10-year-old daughter you know, mom is talking to the 10-year-old daughter about dad. Well, what did your dad say? Well, you know, that's par for the course for him. He was never very dependable, you know, don't. <laughs> that is the worst thing you can do. Do not bring the child into your, you know, circle of, uh, uh, of uh, enmity against your, against your spouse. It's too much for them. I think we need to understand that children are wired in such a way that they need to love their mom and they need to love their dads. Even if mom is not worth loving for whatever reason, or even if dad is not worthy of the love of that child for his behavior or whatever, it doesn't matter. The child has a need to love that parent. So when mom or dad, it works both ways are bouncing their negative feelings, you know, like playing tennis off of a wall, you know, bouncing the ball back and forth for their anger, their disappointment, their disgust, whatever, about the other partner, they don't realize that in doing that, they're damaging their child. Their fear is one of abandonment. 
Their fear is one of powerlessness and distrust. What do you think a child feels when they've lost a parent in this way? Well, their thinking subconsciously is that, well, adults, they just leave you. And adults, they can't be trusted. They need to know that they are okay. So of course we need to talk and encourage them, allow them to make small decisions for themselves, be kind to ex-spouses, even if they don't deserve it, and keep your promises. You know, these children have already been disappointed quite a bit. So the worst thing we do, and I know stuff comes up, you, know, you promise I'll be there for the game and then there's a big emergency at work, you know, uh, we, we understand that. But as much as, you know, I tell parents, whatever you do, do not over promise. Because parents who have been through divorce uh, with the children, they tend to over promise as a way of making up to them the damage that's taken place in the family. Don't over promise. Better you under promise and deliver than over promise and not deliver. All right, the uh, group 13 and above. Adolescents struggle with growing up in the most stable of nuclear families, so it's normal that in a blended family, problems are simply magnified or increased. So for children in this age group where there is a divorce, the main issue is independence. In a nuclear family, the issue is negotiated with biological parents to an eventual decision. You know, mom and dad sit down, you know, these are both the bio parents of this child, and they talk about curfew issues, driving, how far you can drive, and all that kind of stuff. But with the blended family, teenagers have to cope with the independence issue. You know, you have to work out with the single parent, and work it out now with the new parents, and work it out with the separated parents. All the parents have a, an opinion. So in each case the rules are different and the standards change and this leads to confusion and discouragement. If when you go to dad's place on the weekend you get to stay up till 1 a.m. and your curfew is midnight you know, or something like that and you can skip supper and eat late and if you, you, know, you can drive his car and then when you go home to the custodial parents curfew is at 10 o'clock, you cannot have the car after you know, 9 p.m., you, have, you can't be driving around after, you, know, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, these kids are confused. The goal, of course, is one standard that everyone can agree to. Look, there's even this problem in nuclear families, right, where mom and dad don't agree on exactly what the rules should be. So you can imagine how complicated it gets in blended families where you have mom and the new dad over on this side and then you have dad and maybe the new mom on that side. And now you've got four bosses trying to figure out your, <laughs> your curfew and your rules. You know, I just tell parents, look parents, get your heads together first and come up with, a, you know, negotiate what you, you can agree on and then but whatever you do, do not negotiate in front of your children. Okay? Children react and children at different ages react and need different things if a blended household is going to serve them, not just the adults as a home. In other words, the new home is their home too. Don't make them feel like strangers. All right, let's talk about life in two homes. All right, we're talking about kids here and how they react to the blended families if you came in a little late. So let's talk about parenting styles, shall we? At least when the divorce comes, the spouses don't have to live with each other anymore. This is not true for the children, however. Children of blended families have to learn to cope with living in two households when both parents want to share custody. I mean, you don't have to live with your ex-spouse anymore, but your kid does. See what I'm saying? The responsibility for making this work belongs to both parents, not simply to the custodial parent. And I, again, I hear what you're saying. Easier said than done. 
because sometimes the non-custodial parent just does not cooperate. Or sometimes the custodial parent makes the trouble. You know what I'm saying. So some typical tactics are described by the author in that book, Blended Families. I showed you that, uh, I showed you that book uh, recently. So here are the parenting styles that we see in you know, blended families where kids are visiting, where there are visiting rights. There's the star parent. This is the parent who assumes that they are the better and more responsible parent and makes sure that the kids know it. You know your mom, you know, she was never there. She's you know, kind of wacky at times, blah, blah, blah. I know you have to go over there this weekend, but you know, just take things with a grain of salt because I'm the parent that really knows what's going on. Now this may be true, but stars need to realize that they need the other parent, even with their lesser skills. They still need that other parent to provide some kind of wholeness for their children. Remember, you're working on the premise that children need to love both of their parents. They need to love them. Then there's the glue parent. The glue parent obviously can't let go. When kids are ready to leave for visiting, they are sent off with a picture of mommy who will worry and not, you know, they, 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 they won't sleep properly until they return safely. Now you go, but you know mommy is going to be worried about you and I'll be thinking about you and praying about you all the time while you're gone. Glue parents only create anxiety in their children by showing their overprotection and distrust of the other parent. You know, just ask yourself, how would you like to be on the receiving end of that advice when you're 10 or 12? There's the distant parent. Wants as little to do with the other parent as possible, so all communication is done through the children or on voicemail or you know, texting. And this is, tell your father, you know, the father's right there in the car. Tell your father that blah, 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 he, you need to be home by 7 p.m. Sunday because we have a thing, you know. And goes to the car and then, well, daddy says that he, he can't do it because we also are going to the ball game. And like, well, okay, well tell him that if he's going to be late, he's going to, you know what I'm saying? The distant parent. Schedules are off. There are mix-ups, missed dates. There needs to be an, uh, an understanding that the other person is not a mate anymore, but they're still a parent. Just because there's a divorce you know, doesn't mean that the other person is not a parent anymore. There's still some responsibilities. Again, I hear people saying, thinking, yeah, but that's not as easy as it sounds. That's why I'm saying there's such a thing as the distant parent. Another style is the sometimes parent. This is the one who is there sometimes, but you're never sure uh, when, because they're only around sometimes for whatever reason. There's always a reason, always an excuse. Sometime parents should be there at the times that this type of behavior affects the emotional health of their children. This would motivate them to be there. Sometime parents are the ones that break rules, break promises, break schedules. You know, they're just there sometimes. And, and, and the, the, the idea is it, it would almost be better if they weren't there at all. At least it wouldn't, you know, the child would get over the disappointment. But remember, I always go back to my basic rule. A child needs to be able to love both of his parents, his bio parents. Then there's the ruthless parents. The ruthless parent is the parent who is still fighting, who's still getting even by putting down the ex-spouse, the new partner, or sabotaging any chance of peace so they can keep the war going. You hurt me and I will now find a way to hurt you at every possible twist and turn of our relationship. I'm going to get you back. And of course, everyone here is hurt. And in the end, even ruthless will feel rejection from the ones manipulated because kids know what's going on. Don't you mistake it. Kids know who's who. You know, 
They, they, they know what's going on. They don't say it, but as they grow up, eventually they grow up and they, they know who you know, did the work. They know who did the heavy lifting. They know it. And then there's the parent parent. This parent recognizes that the marriage is over, but their role as parents is not over. They strive to be good teammates with, ex, with the ex-spouse and the new blended families, even though it hurts, and they do it for the love and the happiness of their children. They want their children to be happy, and if that means you know, uh, maybe you were the one that was abandoned and, and for whatever reason, and you're the one that's hurt, and you're the one that's the victim, and you know, your, your, your ex-spouse remarries now, and oh, they're all so happy and everything is so great, you know, and, and you've got still a lot of resentment going. It's very tempting to use the children to punish the ex-spouse, but the parent parent understands that the happiness and the well-being and the balance of their child is more important than for them to get even. And in the long run, your child will, will bring you much more joy and happiness and blessings if you avoid seeking revenge. Jesus said that true love is when we lay down our lives for others. And many times, unfortunately, in a, you know, in a failed marriage, this is what has to happen in order to at least give the children of that broken marriage a chance uh, to be happy and to grow up in a balanced way. All right, another, uh, I told you this was going to be a practical lesson on blended families. Helpful hints for the weekend visit. Helpful hints for the weekend visit. Visitation is a normal part of blended families routine that nuclear families rarely encounter. For example, his son comes over from his and his ex-wife's home. Now his present wife's daughters leave to visit their father. You know, there are families like that. The weekend comes, one child comes in and some children leave and you know, it's a kind of musical chairs. Even though this might seem strange to a nuclear family, visitation and the peculiar challenges and problems attached need to be dealt with by blended households. So here are some helpful guidelines to make these, uh, a little, these, these visitation things run a little more smoothly. Of course, this might not apply to some of you in here, but many families have to deal with this. So, First, you know, first piece of advice, take the initiative. If visiting children are left to arrive and then just flop in front of the TV or left to decide what to do, they will invariably be under motivated and it'll come out as I'm bored, I'm mad, I don't like it here, or they become over demanding, hey, let's go to Frontier City or let's go bowling or let's, let's go to a you know, baseball game or whatever. So I tell parents in this situation, plan for the visit, especially the first night. Something that has been planned out where the child is immersed immediately into the activity of that family will allow them to integrate more naturally and safely into the weekend and into the family. I mean, there'll be plenty of time to veg in front of the TV later on. If you've got the child for the weekend, you know, and they arrive Friday and leave Sunday night, hey, make sure Friday is at least set up, Friday evening and something to do on Saturday, hopefully church on Sunday. Number two, provide some structure. Even though yours isn't the custodial home, let's say, it is still a home and children will, you know, will feel safer and happier and more integrated if they know and are expected to stay within the structure. I know uh, this is not the case in our home, but we have grandchildren. And when the grandkids come over to visit, uh, Lee's, you know, uh, is expecting them. She's taking out the toys and she's putting up some coloring books and she's taking out things. So the kids, when they come over and hi, after all the, hi grandma and grandpa, all the kissing is done, there's something to do. Hey, how about we color together? Let's do that together. 
There's a, you know, there's a little bit of structure. Otherwise, they'll be you know, whining and crying and not knowing what to do. So provide structure, meal times, bed times, preparation for church. Uh, this also includes proper conduct and dress. You know, a visit uh, to, to, to the non-custodial parent, for example, a visit is not a vacation. They're not there on vacation where every, anything goes, you can go to bed when you want, get up when you want, eat when you want, that's, that's, you do that on vacation. But a visit from a child you know, uh, that's in the other home, that's not a, it's, it's a time to experience the life of the other parent and share a bonding time with them. And this is more easily done in a structured environment and one which is consistent from visit to visit. If the child knows when I go over there, when I go over to mom's house, well, I better bring some church clothes along because I know that we'll go to church on, on Sunday because there's an expectation of what's going on. Number three, uh, be accepting. Receiving visits from non-custodial children is not like a visit from a friend or from an aunt. You're offering more than just hospitality. You're offering an equal place in your family for a limited time. In other words, if children who are you know, from the custodial parent are coming to your house, then they are equally treated like all the other children in your house. So children who visit need to feel that they are important, they have the same rights and protections as the other children, as well as the same type of atmosphere. Got to move quickly here. Number four, provide a home, not just a room. Visiting children will accept the situation as well as the other family if they're given their own space in the home. Maybe you don't have a, a, an empty room that the visiting child can be, but you, you, you have to get, you know, okay, you're going to be sleeping in the, you know, I don't know, the family room, there's a couch to pull out. Well, that place, that's your space. The goal is to help them deal with the loss of their nuclear family and its, you know, and its dreams, if you wish. This can be done by reassuring them that they have ownership in the new home and family established by the non-custodial parent as well. The parent and the new spouse need to help the child know and develop a relationship with the other children and also the things that are going on in that family and in that home. Number five, give permission to love. Parents, whether they be biological or custodial, feel threatened when their children are you know, uh, uh, showing more love or loyalty to the other parent or to the other set of parents. You know, your bio child leaves for the weekend to go see your, 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 your ex-husband and his new wife, they're going to stay there and they come back and say, yo mom, she, she's really nice. Ooh. You don't want to hear that, do you? <laughs> Sometimes it would be more human to that the child come back saying, man, I don't know what he sees in her. I don't know what daddy sees in her. She's, man, she's 10 times not as nice as you, mom. You're 10 times better than her. You know, you'd rather, your flesh would rather hear that. But if the child comes home and says, wow, dad's new wife, she's so cool. <laughs> she's so nice. This is especially true when the custodial parent feels the weekend parent is cheating by buying their child's love with leniency or gifts or trips. Making snide remarks or suggesting that the other parent is unworthy of love only confuses the child into thinking that they don't have permission to love who is important to them. Dad is important to me. Yes, he walked out. Yes, he has a new life. Yes, he's caused us a lot of trouble. But mom, don't you understand? I need to love dad. I see all this imperfection, but it doesn't matter. I need to love him. Granting them permission to love enables children to mature emotionally and work out the issues of their lives. They'll figure out who did what, they're going to grow up, they're going to know, who's the, you know who, who's, who the bad guy is in all of this. But if you make them choose sides, you stunt their growth and you create resentment in them. Number six, help smooth out transitions. 
Arriving and leaving, you know, just the home, can be emotional moments. Try to understand and deal with these accordingly. It's natural for children to withdraw at departure in order to lessen the pain. Don't see this as a rejection or a sign that they didn't enjoy themselves. So they had a weekend, you tried your best to make them feel welcome, you had stuff going on, and then it's time to leave and they just run right by you. Okay, bye, and they run right by you and jump in the car and they're gone. And your first thought is, well, after everything I did, you know, I mean, a simple thank you would have been okay. You know? What's that other parent doing with this kid? Not teaching them any manners. You know, no. Children you know, are sensitive. It's difficult for them because they have to say goodbye, goodbye, goodbye every weekend. It's goodbye, goodbye, too many goodbyes in their lives. So send them off with love and assurance that you look forward to the next time and try to resolve whatever conflicts before they leave and realize that when they come home that they have been in a different but not necessarily a better or worse world. So don't snoop and don't inquire and give them some space and welcome them home happily. Visitation, you know, visitation is not the best way to parent but it's not an impossible way to parent. It's not the best way, but it's not impossible. You, you can do it. You can do it if you provide them love and assurance that you love them and that you're willing to, you know, uh, you're willing to be a good partner with your ex-spouse. All right, that's our class for this morning. Thank you very much for your attention.